Hello? This is he. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll be right there. I'm here to pick up Alden Call. Did you fill this form out? We'll notify you of a court date within 30 days. Dad, I know I messed up and I'm sorry. Come on, bud. Let's get you home. Hey friends, yesterday during our morning worship service, we had some technical issues with our audio, uh, made our live stream, uh, you really couldn't hear what was going on. And so because of that, it wasn't something we could send to our TV station for that broadcast or even to post to our YouTube channel. So what you're about to hear is a re-recording of what was presented yesterday uh, during our, motion, our, our morning worship service. Uh, it is a part two. Uh, we started last week building a case for the idea that God is truth, and that's very, very important because we live in a world where people want to put everything on a moving scale, and God isn't that way. We spent a, a good bit of time talking about Psalm 119, verse 160, where the New Living says, the very essence of your words is truth. All your regulations will stand forever. The New American Standard says the sum of your word, when you take everything God has said, then what you have is truth. And then it says every one of your ordinances is everlasting. And so as we built that idea, that foundation last week, we noticed from Psalm 119 and from Romans 1 that God's what God has given us, truth is available uh, it's reliable. We can rely on it because it's always right. And then because it's always right, in the end, it's life giving. It's where we find spiritual life. And for all of those reasons, then we uh, we can and we should stake our eternal future on it. And so that brings us to what we want to talk about for a few minutes today. It's the application. It is the so what, if you will. And so let me start it this way. Let me set it up this way. Tim Spivey preaches out in California, and a number of years ago, in a, in a lesson, in a message, he said this. He said, more than anything else, what we believe about God will determine how we live. And I want to repeat that. More than anything else, what we believe about God will determine how we live. And I think he's right in what he's saying there. And as he, as he made that statement, he was talking to people who were in a worship service. So he's talking to Christians. And, and so I believe most of us would agree with that statement. But, but allow me to illustrate something. Even among brethren, um, what, we, what we believe about God, it will, it, it will have some, there will be some variations in the way we live that out. Some are committed to assembling every time our shepherds see fit to have the church doors open. Uh, others seem content to maybe be in worship once a week. And so at some core level, that would seem to suggest that we have some basic differences related to what we believe about God, related to what our love for him requires of us, related to what we believe he will accept what we owe him in return for all that he's done and continues to do. And so, so here's the so what. Here's the big idea of this message. The thing to be thinking about as we study today, what I believe will affect the way I live, but what I believe has zero effect on truth. In other words, what I believe about God doesn't alter truth. Or to say it a third way, my response or lack thereof to God, doesn't change truth. And so for the next few minutes, I want to drill down on that. I want to think more deeply about that, that idea that my response to God, my response, my lack thereof of a response, whatever, it doesn't change truth. Number one, even when I don't know. Now, we've all joked about ignorance being bliss and there are certain situations where it is nice to not have to know all the details, but as it relates to our relationship with God, ignorance is not bliss. And, and we devoted considerable time to talking about that idea in part one, but it's a big enough deal. 
that I think it bears our attention again today, because I, my fear is there there is going to come this this time on Judgment Day when God puts everything in front of people. We all will stand before Him, and my fear is there's going to be some people who say, "Well, I just didn't know." And what we're trying to reiterate is that that's not okay, according to the Bible. We talked about Romans one verse twenty last week. Forever since the world was created. Uh, People have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. They are without excuse. Our recent survey within our congregation, we asked a question where uh, it was about evangelism regarding, okay, if our church, if our congregation, if we were determined that it needed to grow significantly, what would that require of us? And you know this, but if we want to see significant growth within the church, it's going to take all of us sharing God's good news with people. But think about it. If ignorance were okay, evangelism, sharing God's good news, would be a horrible thing to do to people if ignorance were okay. One passage we didn't talk about last week is Acts chapter 17. And Paul, when he's on Athens, uh, he talks about this. And so I want to read a few verses. It's a bit of a lengthy reading, but I want to start in Acts 17, verse 22, and I'll read through verse 31. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you're very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. And as I read here, what you're going to notice, Paul undermines all their false gods because he's going to set up the God he's telling them about as the only God. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations through, throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and some of our own poets, as some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we should not think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he set a day by for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection, Some laughed. Others said, we want to hear more about this later. So Paul is speaking to these folks at Athens. They're religious. They've got altars and shrines to a lot of gods, many gods. Even in case we've left one out, let's have a shrine to the unknown God. And Paul says, that's the one I'm proclaiming to you. It's not okay to be ignorant of him anymore. See, it's not okay for you to be ignorant or for me to be ignorant because I cannot properly respond to what I do not know. And so as you think about your own knowledge of the Bible, as we all think that way, practically speaking, if error were to be taught, when you are listening to someone teach the Bible, would you recognize it to be error based on your own knowledge of the scriptures? Can you take the word of God, the sword of the spirit, as it were, can you take this word of God and use it to solve life's problems? Because when we can take God's word and based on what we find in God's word, use it to solve the the issues that life throws in front of us uh, to do so, that's evidence of wisdom. That's evidence of spiritual maturity. Let's talk about number two. My response doesn't change truth, even when I don't agree. 
You know, sometimes a God question, a scripture question, a church question will come up. And maybe you've heard someone say something like the following. Well, I don't really care about that. That's inconsequential or that just doesn't really matter to me. Now, that could be them saying God's word isn't an, it's not important enough for me to really care about what God has actually said. And we don't we're not going to drill down much on that at this point. It may well be that person's way, though, of expressing a lack of agreement with what God's word says. Because we live in a world today where too often, even among religious people, we've 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 agreed to some or accepted some really bad theology, some beliefs about God that are found nowhere in Scripture. Remember a guy named Naaman from the Old Testament? If you've uh, been a church going person, uh, even as a little kid, you talk about you learn about Naaman in your Bible classes. But Naaman serves as this classic study of what disagreeing with God looks like, along with how futile it is to do so. 2 Kings chapter 5 is the passage. Naaman is this powerful military leader, but he's dealing with this career-ending death sentence called leprosy. He's desperate, and, and through some circumstances, he gets in touch with God's prophet, Elisha. But when Naaman goes to see Elisha, Naaman ends up feeling very disrespected because Elisha doesn't even come out of the house to meet with Naaman. Elisha simply sends some instructions down to him, passes a message down to him. And and then when the message comes, it's also insulting because it's not what Naaman expects. What Naaman is told to do is to go dip seven times in the nasty Jordan River. And so in your Bible, if you read 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11, it does a really good job of summarizing Naaman's key problem. This is what the Bible says. But Naaman, when he receives these instructions, became angry and stalked away. And this is what Naaman said. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of his Lord, the Lord his God, and heal me. But see, Naaman's thinking, his disagreement did not change truth. It didn't change the instructions. And, and Naaman found healing when he responded to those instructions in obedience. And and it's a real head scratcher. He's desperate enough to to seek a solution from God's prophet, even though he's not a Jew himself. But when he doesn't agree with the instructions, he gets angry. You ever heard somebody react to the Bible by saying, something's read straight out of the Bible, and they react by saying, well, that's just not right. I don't agree with that. Or, I've been taught something different all of my life. Or that's just, it seems just way too narrow-minded to me uh, for somebody to try to say that there aren't multiple pathways to heaven. Even Jesus, though, talked about that narrow way. Or somebody says, if if a loving God would really condemn a person to eternity in hell, I, I just don't think I want anything to do with him. I may say it, friends or family members may teach it, but truth has not changed and truth is always found in the word of God. It's not about whether or not I agree. It's always about what God has stated to be so. Has God stated a thing to be so? Then it's truth. Always remember, if we find ourselves disagreeing with God, there are two primary reasons that that can occur. Number one is ignorance, and and we just have talked a lot about that. But then the second is relying on human wisdom, which is all that remains for anyone who doesn't seek God's word on something. If I don't seek what God may have weighed in with on any given question, then all that's left is human wisdom. And, And the Bible talks about the futility of human wisdom twice in the book of Proverbs. 14 verse 12, 16 verse 25, this is what the Bible says. There's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. You think about all the disagreements that abound even among church-going people. 
What is God's truth regarding his plan for salvation? What is God's truth regarding women's role in the church? What is God's revealed plan for church government? One of the things I mentioned yesterday is, see, we've got religious neighbors down the street who are legitimately hurting right now as their church votes on what is at its core what they believe God's truth to be. Now, I think you know this, but I do need to say it. Voting on truth from God, that's not a biblical concept, but it doesn't mean that our heart doesn't go out to them. It doesn't mean we don't hurt with them. The list could go on and on, but I think you get the idea in the end. Doctrine matters. What God has said matters. Knowing and following God's teaching. It's what's always been. That's what's pleasing to God. Always has been, always will be. Paul's instruction to Timothy, along with a, a foretelling of what would later occur among religious people, the words are probably familiar to you, but they're, they're worth repeating. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to, to sound and wholesome teaching. The New American Standard there says sound doctrine. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truth and chase after myths. Fortunately for Naaman, he found healing with God through obedience to the message that God sent through his prophet Elisha. We find spiritual healing today in exactly the same way when we surrender in obedience to God's message. Number three, my response doesn't change truth. Even when I'm overcome by the moment, and simply not thinking. All the way back in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 19, Lot's wife is an interesting case study for this. Uh, when we find her, Sodom and Gomorrah are about to be destroyed. And I want to go to Genesis chapter 19 and read two excerpts from that chapter. I want to go first to Genesis 19, verse 15 beginning. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angels seized his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city. For the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives. And don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Notice verse 23 of that text. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utterly destroyed them along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Beyond not even knowing her name, the Bible doesn't tell us what she was thinking. We don't get an inside trip via the Holy Spirit into, into the mind of Lot's wife. So we don't know what's on her mind for sure. We're not told what caused her to look back. Maybe she didn't know. Maybe she didn't know she wasn't supposed to look back. I mean, the angel did say it. It's very clear in Scripture. But how do we know she was listening? I, and, and, and maybe you as well, I, I'm told from time to time, and it's a valid criticism that I don't listen as well as I ought to. Well, maybe that day she wasn't listening. It was a high-pressure situation. Or maybe she didn't care. And again, we didn't take time to talk about that response and how it doesn't change truth. But, you know, her thinking could have been, well, hello, it's not every day you get to see God destroy a city. There's no way I'm going to miss seeing what that looks like. I'm going to be able to tell my grandkids about this. And it's really sad and it's really ironic because instead of having a story to tell her grandkids, she became a story. 
not only for her grandkids, but for all of us who read the Bible regarding what disobedience looks like. But then again, maybe she didn't agree with the instruction. You know, maybe her thought process as she's going and is about to turn around, she's thinking, well, surely the angel didn't mean not even to look back, not even to glance back and see what's going on. Just because I'm going to look back doesn't mean I'm not, doesn't mean I'm going back. And so I don't agree with them at that at all. I'm still getting out. I'm still pretty much obeying. I'm still pretty much doing what the angel has told me to do. But maybe, and in my mind, probably, she was overcome by the moment, and she simply wasn't thinking. You know, that's one of the things that happens to us sometimes. It's a bad situation. It's high emotion. We stop thinking about God's truth in those moments, and we end up acting, uh, doing things, whatever it is. We end up living in a way, doing something that we know isn't right. But in the end, the response by Lot's wife, it didn't change truth. It didn't change the instruction. In the end, she illustrates that what God says matters and what God and, and when God says something, God means what God says. Now, it makes me and probably you as well thankful for his grace and his patience and his mercy. And, and normally we have this opportunity to make things right today when we've gotten it wrong. It makes me thankful that God's response to us for our sin isn't immediate today. But in the end, God is truth, whether I know, whether I care, whether I agree, whether I lose my head, I'm responsible. All of us are responsible for responding to God's unchanging truth. Practically speaking, what does all of this mean? Over time, all of us have come to hold certain beliefs about God. And I suspect we've developed these beliefs in a variety of ways. Maybe from a friend, maybe from a family member that we trust. Maybe it was from a religious leader that everyone was raving about, somebody who really knew how to capture the attention of an audience. Everybody wanted to hear this person. Um, if, if you've never done so, it would be really healthy in a quiet moment to, to do some self-analysis. How have I arrived to hold the beliefs that I have right now? How did I get here? Because here's the thing. Here in the U.S., we are educated we are literate. No place on our planet has more access to the word of God than we do. And yes, you can go earn a college degree in biblical studies. You can do a degree around studying this book, and, and I would recommend it. There's all so much good that can come from it. The word of God is a mind that no individual ever, it, it, it never, it's a treasure. Nobody ever fully minds the word of God. But God delivered his word to us in such a way that all of us can read it and come to an understanding of what he expects of us. And so this is my plea. This is what I need you to think about. Please be sure that you arrive at what you believe about God because of your own personal, careful examination of the scriptures. Don't stake your eternal future on what you haven't proven for yourself to be so from the word of God. The psalmist shows us how to respond to God's truth and, and don't have a lot of time to spend on it. But Psalm 119, and, and we talked a lot in that about, in, about that passage in, uh, in, in part one. The psalmist's reaction was, I love your promises. Psalm 119, verse 140. I find joy in your commands. Psalm 119, verse 143. I put my hope in your words. Psalm 119, verse 147. How did the psalmist arrive with, how, how was his mindset like that? Well, see, I believe the psalmist understood something that we need to understand today. I believe the psalmist understood that God will never require anything of us that isn't best for us. And as a result, he found love, joy, hope in the Lord's commands. I want to leave you with one passage of scripture this morning. My response to truth is important. 
My response to truth may change where I spend eternity, but it will not change what God defines as being right or what God defines as being wrong. And see, knowing that God is truth and and knowing that God will get it right, it ought to either bring me great comfort or it ought to motivate me toward right living. I can find comfort in knowing that even though people here may hurt me, they may mistreat me, I don't have to in this life, I don't have to keep score and I don't have to try to get even. I don't have to try to pay people back. I I don't have to keep a ledger. I don't have to do all that work because I know God loves me and I know God has promised that God will take care of all of that. I can also find comfort in knowing that if I'm a child of God and if I'm walking in the light, I can count on God's grace and mercy to cleanse me from my shortcomings, as 1 John chapter 1 talks about. But if I'm not serious about my walk with God, if I call myself a Christian, but I'm not really serious about being a Christian, a Jesus follower, Knowing that God is truth and knowing that God will get it right, it ought to result in the kind of fear that causes me to change the way I'm living. Let me leave you with a passage from Romans chapter 2, verse 4, beginning. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? This is Paul writing to the church at Rome. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you're stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they've done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Legendary gospel preacher Gus Nichols is he did a lot of counseling during his ministerial career, ministerial career, excuse me. And it was reported that there were three overriding questions that he liked to ask folks when he was working with them. He would ask, number one, do you want to do what is right? Do you want to do what's pleasing to God? And how do you if you're sitting down and you're looking for help, how would you ever answer no to that? It's a great question. Then he would say, he'd follow up, are you willing? to do what is right, because sometimes I may want to, but being willing to, I got to start thinking about certain things that have to change. Are you willing to do what is pleasing to God? And then number three, are you willing immediately to begin doing what the Bible says is the right thing to do, to immediately begin doing what is pleasing to God? If there's something amiss in your life, if there's something we can help you with, if you've got questions from this message today, our tag will come at the, up at the end. You can contact me. I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I would be happy to open the Bible with you and let you read for yourself what God has said needs to be happening in your life, what needs to be happening in my life. So if we can help you with that, we'd love to. We'd also love for you to worship with us in person. Come out and visit with us here at North Highlands. Our Sunday morning worship is at 930. We'll follow that with Bible classes for all ages at 1030 about 10.30 or so. Sunday evening, we have Bible classes for all ages at six o'clock, and then we assemble midweek for another round of Bible study at 6.30. And so we'd love to connect with you in that way. God is truth. The world may say that truth's always on a sliding scale. That's not what God says about his truth. May God bless us as we continue to study his word. Just, just a minute, I'm on the phone right now. Nope, uh, come back here and clear your dishes from the table. Yes, yeah, stop! No, guys, stop. Cut it out, both of you. This is not fair. Dad would have let me go. 
Is Daddy watching us from heaven?